had a real diversity of conversations over the course of the last couple of days. And as I think I mentioned um, when we were kicking things off, that's one of the really great things about the River Management Society is that we're from all different sectors. Um, uh, the nonprofit sector, the government sector, and um, uh, the commercial sector. And so, um, Clady went from ORS is going to come up and, and talk a little bit about his work with ORS. And I just want to publicly recognize uh, ORS and thank you on behalf of my family because you know the opportunity to go down a river to get your uh, to get kids in particular connected with rivers to get them outside to build memories as a family. Um, ten years ago, I uh, came. I was going between my park service job to the nonprofit sector, and we came to the Klamath River uh, in the month between my jobs, and we uh, uh, brought our family. I'm gonna get really choked up here. Um, we brought our family, and I was telling Clavy and some other people that my youngest, who's now 20, he was 10 at the time. Um, or nine, maybe even. Um, he's self-described as indoorsy. And, um, uh, <laughs> and he sat at the front of the boat with his guide, Andrew, who was sitting on top of all the coolers and everything and rowing. And I've got this great picture, I sent it to Clavy, of my son Owen just sitting on the front of the boat, just watching the river talking with Andrew about video games. <laughs> <laughs> and they had the best time. And it's funny, because as I was leaving, I was telling my son Owen, you know, hey, I'm going up to the, up to the Klamath River. And he's like, that's that place where we went. And I was talking with Andrew about video games, and they made me eat couscous and coleslaw. And I didn't like it. <laughs>
for a product, certainly. They don't go on their own. They go because they have an opportunity to be taken care of. They, you know, you cut your thing and you get it taken care of. You know how to use a grouper. You can have these valuable skills only because of this industry and the people who started it. So, <laughs> Uh, and 
taking care of the families and to, uh, to basically not only create a venue for families to bond with other families, but then for organizations, nonprofits, uh, like Friends of the River, like American Whitewater, uh, like American Rivers, and to, uh, you know, to get people together and be a venue for these multi-day trips, for groups of people like yourselves to get, you know, to have those chats around the campfire late at night and to, uh, to help strategize how, how we can, you know, uh, improve, improve our, our natural resources as opposed to just uh, building bigger and better and uh, more destructive. Uh, but um, anyway, as dad and mom fought to stay alive, because believe it or not, uh, outfitting is sort of a rough, rough and tumble business, being uh, seasonal, it's, it's, it's a tough gig um, to, uh, <coughs> to be able to keep the lights on through the winter. And uh, so dad's expansiveness to try to diversify and uh, you know, try to uh, have permits in the best spots in the Western United States, uh, he certainly uh, well, took advantage of other distressed uh, mom and pops by buying them out. Uh, and so, but that, that growth now has sort of settled. Oars, uh, my brother and I, having uh, inherited it uh, with my father's passing in 2016 uh, from cancer, uh, we decided to slow down the, the growth side of things and to work on to, to work on our company culture as opposed to just helping sell vacations, uh, river-based vacations, but to try to spend more time uh, and more thought in, uh, in growing the constituency beyond uh, the, the well-to-do or the upper middle class uh, with our expensive Grand Canyon trips. Uh, we have tried to, uh, to give back. And so we're very much still learning, just like me, I'm still learning how to do public speaking. Uh, <laughs> uh, my brother and I and uh, our team, you know, we're trying, having renamed the Oars Foundation uh, to the Pam and George Went Foundation after, my, after our founders, after our mom and dad. Uh, we are hitting up our well-to-do guests to give to our foundation to, in, order, in order to then fund uh, disadvantaged groups, uh, uh, mainly in California, but uh, we're really excited about opportunities to, to work with uh, Paul and Rios de Rivers and those types of opportunities with uh, the Yurok tribe. Um, it's something that we're, we're just sort of learning as we go because we we realize um, that we did just inherit this. We are part of the patriarchy, I'm sorry to say, but we uh, feel a, a, a powerful impetus to, uh, to continue to work with, with disadvantaged youth, especially with the foundation, and to, uh, you know, as, as another example beyond uh, working with uh, Rios to Rivers, uh, this uh, summer we've got a group that we're going to fund entirely, you know, to make it, uh, you know, so that cost is not a, not a prohibiting factor for working with a group called the Conway Mika Tillicum uh, group. It's an academic program that empowers Native youth to access higher education and navigate educational systems, uh, encouraging self-determination and strengthening critical thinking by deeply connecting them to a community that values their aspirations and the resilience of our seven generations. Um, and so, uh, I, I mentioned these two groups, it's just a, a small example, a small sliver of uh, our efforts to try to leverage uh, you know, wealthy folks that can, that can afford our Grand Canyon trips or our Middle Fork Sand trips to, to guilt trip them <laughs> to, uh, to remind them of how privileged they are uh, just as just as I am and to try to, uh, to continue to grow the constituency of people that care about rivers and that includes uh, 
inviting people that haven't been invited in the past. Um, and so another little uh, example of that is uh, uh, having uh, a Pride Month that we, uh, we started last year um, on the South Fork of the American River. And uh, uh, we uh, you know, sort of passed through where we're giving $15 a person to the Sacramento LGBT uh, group um, because this as a representative of just trying to work towards a more inclusive inclusive community where people are invited uh, from all walks of life and, uh, and so rather than uh, continue this sort of a sales pitch we sort of vibe to this. I hope it doesn't sound too sales pitchy, but uh, I'd like to just turn it back to you all who maybe, uh, maybe I can get a, a sign of hands for people that have worked in the industry of the, as a river guide. I don't know how wow. To, yeah, so there's wow. quite a few of us here. So, so maybe could I solicit stories and experiences from you to potentially share and add to this discussion of, of leveraging business and finances to uh, help grow the community. Anyone want to give me a break? Yeah, so <laughs> I, I started river guiding college and I worked for ARDA um, and I now work for the governor's office of business and economic development. So I don't think there's any other commercial river guides and in my agency anyway. But, and both my kids work for ARTA um, as commercial guides up on, the, up on the Road River. And we're based in Mount Shasta. Um, I had a, a, a question for you uh, rather than share experience, but um, I think a lot about you know the, the ancestral lands of the places where we're running these rivers. And you know, you mentioned you know, way back in the 60s, tacking on $10, you know, as an opt-in um, for people to donate. Um, but, you know, is there consideration of having some sort of a, like a shoe-me, like a gift tax for tribes, um, just as like an educational component to add on to trips? Like, hey, you know, here's, you know, add on 50 bucks and we're gonna give this to the tribe that is, you know, Mm -hmm. within the lands that we're running these trips, you know, just to, to, to educate people about that and, and create some capacity building for, for tribes, because I know that they have a really hard time engaging in, in public processes related to, to, to lands and, um, and a lot of the, the thousand page documents that you know, are, are getting issued to them. And, and I, I hear that feedback all the time, that they just need a little boost and the commercial outfitters, I feel like, could, could really start something there. And I don't know if Oars does that or if any other commercial outfitters do it, but yeah, that would be so awesome. I think it's a great idea. I think it's a great idea. Well, uh, we, we do solicit our guests to, to donate uh, to different groups as a pass through a dollar a day, um, but uh, just through the inflation, we could certainly increase that. Um, uh, and yeah, we, we have, maybe belatedly, uh, but uh, three years ago we started to acknowledge in our, uh, on our website, in our materials, those ancestral lands that, that, uh, that we do float through. Um, and we're just trying real hard to not, uh, not do it wrong, I, I don't know, to, to, to have it smack of tokenism or uh, or just PR, uh, but uh, that's a, that's a great idea to continue that acknowledgement to then just get some money behind that as well. Uh, and that forward. That's, it's right you. on the registration form, you know, of that particular trip to that particular right. tribe. Yeah, t traditionally we have we've done that in terms of just uh, NGOs and nonprofits. Yeah. Which is which is a, a legacy of, of our community, which is white. Uh, How many customers do you get a year that could be educated just in the act of registering for their trip, uh, right. you know, uh, instead of having sort of anonymous organization? Yeah. Think right. about it, and I don't yeah. want to hijack the <laughs> conversation. Thank you. Oh. So, 
you're doing great things, Orange is doing great things. Is right. there a movement within the larger Calvary community to come together and work together to address this issue? I'd like to think so. Yes, uh, America Outdoors Association is is getting on board with the DEI uh, initiatives, um, but you know, as an industry, I think we're we're just at the beginning of our learning process. Uh, it's, it's only just begun. So, not enough. Not enough. But there's potential. There's potential. So uh, I was just curious, do you, how many guides, do you, do you have guides that are, you know, representative of the indigenous communities and the landscapes that you pass through? I was just on a, on a commercial, uh, commercially outfitted trip myself, and, and one of the guides was of Native heritage, and he added a richness to the trip of, I mean, we had Ken here yesterday talking about this river and what it meant to his people, and it was a similar type of experience, you know, just in the conversations that you're having around the campfire and the people, you know, curiosity people have on the raft. It really added an incredible richness to the experience. Yeah, Zach, Zach, Sam, uh, yeah, he is, uh, we're, we're extremely proud of him. He, uh, he and his sister went through our guide school um, and uh, I think his aunt paid for the guide school. Uh, and that, that got us thinking as he got into our system and decided to jump through our hoops and went through the training. Um, we, we have subsequently carved out scholarships out of this George and Pam Wendt Foundation. And we are specifically earmarking you know, all expense paid uh, slots in our guide schools in California and Utah uh, to help sort of build off of success say there with, with Zach. Um, so then and a follow up question on that is we I think all of us in the work that we do we we encounter people that would benefit from opportunities that we've had that maybe they don't and what's the what's the best entry point for, you know, what you're providing to the foundation? Like is that a you know, a we is there a website we're sending to, or is there an introduction we can make, or you know, kind of who's managing that? Is that you, or is it someone else of yours? Uh, yeah, we do have an executive director, uh, Dylan Silver, who's helping lead that charge. Um, yeah, so far, it's we have just organically reached out to uh, different groups in the Bay Area. That's where we started that that effort, um, and we think we'd like to believe that. The younger the kids are that get out on our trips, uh, the maybe more the impact that that might have, that, that might inspire them to uh, to stick around in the, in the river community. Uh, so, you know, we work with Latino Outdoors, uh, uh, a bunch, and uh, a group that escapes me of uh, the children of uh, incarcerated parents. Uh, and. And also, we have invited tribes in different areas, different parts of the, uh, the country. The Sheep, Eater, Sheep Eaters tribe in, uh, outside Lewiston has done a number of day trips with us. And so we're, we hope that we can uh, build off of those initial organic outreaches to, to formalize things, to, to, uh, to, create, um, to create a more sustainable Curriculum potentially that would help reinforce uh, maybe a, an opportunity that a, that a young person has uh, to get to facilitate a second trip um, or a third, you know, uh, and and we just need to continue to plow money into these scholarships and to be intentional on who you know who we accept on those applications, and, uh, and so we do. Yeah, we believe that we can intentionally carve out awarding scholarships to, to people of color, to, to Native Americans, uh, to people who identify as LGBT as well. Uh, and so we're just at the, at the beginning of that, and uh, uh, yeah, messaging and promoting that is uh, lots of room for, for growth. Thanks. 
Sir. And following up with the tribal uh, representation, obviously it's great to get Native youth involved, but for instance, BLM's got a project that'll be on next week on the, on the Grand Ronde with, with the partnership with the Nez Perce tribes where they provide Native kids um, its interns to, to do ethnographic work. But in years past, we've been real fortunate, I feel, um, to have tribal elders come at the, the, night, the evening before we launch and tell their stories, uh, which is a prime focus of this particular project. But I think you're in a position also to reach out to tribes uh, that have ancestral ties to those rivers uh, that you provide services mm -hmm. on and really engage with them. You know, you can, you can sponsor kids to be guides, but you could also encourage and potentially sponsor elders to come and tell their story. And I, I mentioned to Ken, you know, in meetings like this that I go to with tribal folks, they always start out with a song, a prayer, that sets kind of context for our working together. And I really wish he had done that. Um, but that kind of thing, I mean, like before you launch, can really put people in a place to appreciate the river and its, its meaning to the people in a much deeper way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well said. Yeah, there are ways that the agencies could facilitate uh, outfitters' uh, engagement in longer-term conservation or inclusiveness and diversity. And, and our interface is the permit right, for the particular workers. And we do have an ability to, to discount those for service work and other things. You know? So just is there anything you see in agency policy related to commercial recreational activities that could be changed hmm. to, to do more hmm. for environmental work or stewardship work or, or working with native communities. Yeah, I'm curious about that. Yeah, boy, I, uh, I would flip it right back to you. <laughs> what, what, well, there has been legislation proposed, you know, and, and it's around, around some of that work. I mean, there, and there are examples like horse packers and outfitters clearing trail, and then they get their fees discounted for the amount of work and material that they provide to do the service for the bike. I was just trying to think of, you know, not all river companies are oars, you know, and so how could we uh, accelerate that work through an administrative change? in the way we manage the rivers too, for commercial purposes. So, you know, Grand Canyon Guides Association and others have done all sorts of educational seminars and work and training, and that's, you know, the parts that support that. So I'm just curious on a bigger scale, like how do you scale the work that you guys are doing up and like make it like the bar that others have to ride?
nervous about you know, having frank environmental educational <laughs> discussions. So we, we don't have the answer, but it's something that Friends of the River wants to um, see if we can do in collaboration with other organizations more successfully. But how can we reach that audience? They're already enjoying themselves out there. They're the ones who really might be um, reachable in terms of some of these ideas. Uh, you know, rivers are, as we, you guys all know this, but as we have to adapt to climate change, it's just going to be rougher and rougher. And rivers are one of the biggest sources of resilience on the landscape. They're just so much more important than they've ever been before in the big picture. So how can we reach the people who are already enjoying them and help them understand that? And maybe it is through changing regulations and requiring education. I mean, I have, I, that is like a brilliant idea. It, it, it's not happening um, well, I think there's, I mean, it, traditionally it has. I mean, there have been a lot of like partners floats for years and years we would do out there and guide and, and other partners to go down the river and just that uh, convening generally, the whole bunch of stuff. And I think there's opportunity. Uh, I'll give you an example. Like the pet, there's the pay at river, your pay at river, right? And, and all the outfitters pay fees, and people pay fees, and they go down the river, and they have a pot of money, and they get to choose where to spend that money on that river. None of it goes to the deal I'm out here because the forest really steals it. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but the idea of, of using some of the funds that are generated from the river for um, uh, use purposes, for outreach, education, scholarship, you know, BLM requires Burning Man to have carbon credits. Like, mm -hmm. why? Because they burn shit, you know. <laughs> but, uh, you know, there's ways to rethink our current tools in a, in a whole different way. So, like, you know, when, when Dan's dream of uh, the, the new Grand Canyon of the mm -hmm. West um, being created and creating a space for it, why not create a modern framework for utilization of those funds that it generates, that we have the already have the authority to collect and determine. And then in, in the new models of giving back to community, grants, scholarship work, that kind of stuff. It's totally possible. Because when you say stewardship, it's sort of a big pot of opportunity. So rethinking how we manage rivers while we're creating them, this has not happened before, right? So thinking about those mechanisms while you're doing this other work. I think it would be really, you know, have some uh, level of opportunity that we don't have in other places, you know. But rethink, just because we have a certain, oh, we have to require permits, oh, it has to be this much, 3% of gross, or whatever it is, that's just stuff we made up, you know. And we can change <laughs> later on. So rethinking that, I think, is uh, important while we're talking about, you know, whether it's commercial use or permitted activities how people pay, you know, and how that pay might make things more inclusive to someone else who doesn't have it. But, you know, so that's Well, I, have, I guess it's a comment, and it, I'm not offering anything concrete, but just from my experience working with outfitters and permit systems in various places, I think that it's a much more productive relationship when our interface isn't solely based on permits and fees, and that there is a more robust conversation going on. So if some of those types of things can get baked into the system, either culturally or from a management standpoint, I don't know if we've ever really gone into a deeper place in that regard, it would, it would broaden and empower the relationship in multiple ways so that there's not so much, I mean, gosh, I mean, Patrick working with the shoots, right? We both work with the shoots, Monica. <laughs> and and um, the, the perception of the BLM as administrating agency versus like, well, this is why we're all here. It takes a little more of a lift to change that picture. And 
Some of us are better at it than others, and if we have capacity, we're better at it than others. Like if we are able to hire enough people to keep the toilet clean, then maybe we can have these other richer conversations. But if there's some ways to think about it differently, it would be it would be powerful. And um, I mean, with Grand Canyon, like the annual guides training seminar, moving from like who gets what piece of the pie in the allocation system to actually now we go and just talk about some of the research we're doing and stuff like that. that those sorts of things help. But um, um, I think that folks here are great, have great minds and access and ideas to broaden thinking around that. So, I mean, just even introducing the question is an interesting question, Bob, so I appreciate that. And I appreciate maybe asking the room for <coughs> feedback. The room. First, I just wanted to thank you. I really appreciate the efforts that you're doing just to put out a welcoming hand, you know? Um, so of us that have been on the river a long time, we were talking a lot about like our being the only lady and some of the challenges that go along with that. And like having a pride event, like that's awesome. So thank you for doing that. Thank you for looking beyond just profit. Like that's awesome. Um, I also want to say that uh, one of the things that I've been able to do is have a volunteer li your library within the year and diversity funds. And so that way, what we're able to do is provide some of the um, financial hurdles that people would, they're already donating their time. So then to have to go out and buy expensive gear to be able to even donate their time is just another layer. So that's one thing we've been able to do is, is create a gear library. And, and um, then that pairs with a lot of the other partnerships that we've worked with with minority serving institutions and creating those career ladders with hired employees. So. Thank you, and if you guys have any of your funding, maybe <laughs> think about a year library. It's <laughs> yeah. a good idea. Definitely. So, Bob, what would it take? What would change take? And who? I think what it depends on what we're changing. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I mean, people think, oh, you know, if you talk to somebody who implement that. First year rec planner, here's your SRP policy, follow it, do it. You know, but they don't realize that that was just written by people with the best idea at the time they had and with the political context they had at the time. And, and much of our policy around outfitters was driven by outfitters. And in the Grand Canyon, the outfitters actually wrote the legislation that, that constrain how the Park Service man manages concessions, right? And it really hands from how and the level of fees we charge and everything else, right? So maybe now it's time to rethink that. But those are, that's legislation. Policy is generated by the agencies and can be updated. We hate to do it, we're scared of it. Uh, it takes a lot of work. But rethinking <coughs> through a lens of inclusivity uh, equity, everything else is what we're doing right now. I mean, we have executive orders that tell us to evaluate the art policies for barriers that we sell to the public. So we have an opportunity right now uh, with this administration to take a really hard look at how we administer. And so, but it has to come from <coughs> it has to come from the field. So we have to know uh, what are those barriers and. What are those things, and what's constrained you in, uh, in your bar service, or BLM, or park service policy that could be tweaked? And so we're being asked that right now at the high level. So you have a bunch of people who may have never worked in the field making decisions about how those policies are written. So you really, you ask me, you shouldn't be asking me. Well, I'm yeah. asking, I'm not asking you to do it. I'm asking you what you think it will take. Well, I think it's all attainable. Yeah, I mean, think of what we did for the kids pass, right? Just one, you know, creating a, a pass for fourth grade. You would think like, no brainer, that should be easy. Well, we pitched that to four administrations and two of them were Democratic. And finally, the Obama administration picked up on it, but it was only in a cocktail party where it was mentioned at the White House, and then the next day it was done. 
So, so that's what I mean. It has to you know, come more, more organic. And so the clam, I think, is an interesting opportunity because you have so many agencies involved and you're looking at this context that think about, you know, we're all focused on the river, but think about how we're going to manage this place later. Like, what is it going to look like when it's one big river and everybody, you know, what, what kind of form will be created for the administration management? The stuff that we do with river management society people. So, so rethinking here is an interesting uh, opportunity. And so what would a single permit system look like? Or, you know, how do we differentiate day use areas? Or, you know, how, what's the model going to be? Because when it happens, you don't want to be um, in the emergency mode of response, right? You want to be proactive. So outlining some alternative concepts that are more innovative would be the time now, right? You want to kind of have that stuff floating in percolating and, uh, and thinking about it. So that's all, I'm, I'm just saying it's, a, it's an interesting, you know, um, the play you know, commitment from and out there. We're seeing much more engagement, social and environmental engagement from the outdoor industry than any other industry. You know, we don't get a lot of it from, from the, some of the other industries we have to work with, but there is some stuff going on, and that's always sort of packaging and centralized. Stewardship work or stewardship contract, whatever that is, you know. Um, but I'm just saying, let's let's think more broadly mm -hmm. about about some of the stuff. And so we're right actively now identifying barriers to participation in outdoor recreation and access. You know, everything from law enforcement, how we do that, to to fees, to even our recreation.gov. I can't think of anything. M more of a barrier than recreation does. So I haven't got to get started on permits. But uh, uh, now I'm just saying, you know, it's, it's, we have a window of opportunity where there's this openness at the highest level to come up with really creative ideas. But we can't cook them all up. It has to come like, and that's why running pilot <coughs> programs or uh, mm -hmm. experimental things you know, are important so we can kind of say, well, this is working, like gear libraries can work. And then, but the next person says, well, what about the liability? I want to have a life jacket, or what about, you know, you start going on down the whole rabbit hole. So you say, well, let's do it here and see what happens, you know, and then you find out it's okay. So I think that's part of what this is about, you know, and so that's what's uh, kind of exciting about the, about the planet. That's why I came all the way out here really think about it in like a new way because it's it's premier. It's everything. My director was out here a month ago, you know, my secretary was talking about it. So you don't get that kind of high level mm -hmm. buzz. And if you could weave in equity into this and describe what that looks like and how it's how the business model works, I think you could really have something that other people could adopt or, or mm -hmm. a model that other I would offer to, to Jen if you guys since you're here, this is your term. If there's something that we can do to help in the context of pilot and experiment in other places. Yeah. And uh, if I could add on something about uh, permit systems, so that's something that Confluence does a lot of work in. Um, a few years ago, uh, we, we uh, made a, a management plan for the Snake River through Jackson Hole. Um, and uh, one of our innovations on that project was an in-season reservation pool um, where the, 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 uh, the outfitters don't own the permits. Um, they can apply to be an outfitter and then the reservations are um, available for them as soon as, they, as soon as they book a trip throughout the season. Um, and overall, that's we, we're just we just um, got hired again by them to uh, mm. to you know see how see how that permit system is going. And overall, it's working it's working really well on all but the on all but the busiest days of the year. Um, there are permits. There's still permits available for the outfitters, and you know some some outfitters are awesome and really great to work with. 
Um, some outfitters are, are more challenging to work with. And so even though this perm system is working really well overall, you'd not believe the, you know, the number of holes they've poked in our, in our plan. Um, uh, just, just in a, just in the time span of four years. Um, and so there's, there's also an issue with on the ground implementation, um, and, 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 uh, you know, institutional turnover at a small level and, you know, the people who are running the plan right now don't necessarily, uh, you know, they weren't there for the original process. They may not be voters. Um, so they may not understand like how important some of the, some of the elements of the plan are. So it's a, it's a tough process. And, uh, if anybody wants to talk to me about, uh, permit systems for rivers, I'm, I'm here for it. <laughs> I have a question for Katie. Um, are we still on permits? Because I'm going to ask a question not about permits. <laughs> I wanted to shift to local government. I know that com commercial outfitters are really helpful in getting elected leaders out on the water to kind of experience and, and educate. And in in this seen, you know, in the Klamath River. So I live in Salt Lake County and we have five county supervisors who all oppose the removal of the dams on the Klamath River. And, you know, they're, they're disengaged and throw a little tantrum and it's just tantrum. And so is there a way, and I get to work with all of them and I love them all, and then I get to work with all of you and love all of you too. It would, if I could get one of them or, and their child on a oars trip, <laughs> Where there's no agency people <laughs> there who they don't trust, like to open their mind and really experience that, it it, it could really sh like uh, shift the the dialogue. You got to hear Is, Tom's story about getting all these people. <laughs> I swear to God, on a river trip, and he fixed the chama by getting all the big wigs on a trip. Ask Tom real quick at some point before you leave. I want, I, I want the little wig, the <laughs> supervisor, on a commercial trip to experience it. And no, no agency, no talk of like the politics of it, but just to really like experience it. Is there a mechanism that, that's available to, to, to do that, you know? Um, in your foundation or through, I, don't, I mean, I don't, yeah. I don't even know. I just yeah. want to grow my Right. We're, we're learning, and I think that's, that's relationship driven. A lot, a lot of times, I think, and uh, that is one of the weaknesses that ORS experiences with, with being in too many places at once. Um, so uh, that's that's something that we could potentially ask uh, regional managers to, to reach out consistently and uh, invite to uh, the various uh, get-togethers we started a couple of years ago a boathouse tour in which we just invite locals to come to see what it's like in a, in a warehouse and uh, meet these river people. Uh, and uh, in, the one in Idaho was, was pretty fascinating in Lewis to, to get even jet boat operators in with the, uh, the ore powered operators. It's, uh, and uh, yeah, connections and, and relationships uh, can be Formed, I think that sounds the, like a maybe to me. Okay, so I guess yeah. put it on the agencies to help. I think we can do this. Free up their and we have it? have done this. Um, we did a trip on the road, so it was not with county supervisor, but with the chief of staff for a Republican member of Congress. We put some real thought, and, and he came out with his family, and it was transformative. And you know, we can we can figure this out. Okay, you and me, Tom, but you gotta keep your name out of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let me uh, just clip those versions more of what uh, Tom told me yesterday about how he got basically saved the Chama and he got the heads of all these different agencies and he invited them on a trip, had an outfitter that donated rafts and time to get them safely down, got the guys that controlled the dam here and the one that controlled the dam there and the guys that controlled the land around it, etc. And they can give you more of the details on who those heads were, but they all went down and they kind of had a, you know, a nice camp and they sat around and just kind of, how do we get this thing fixed? And, and 
like it, he says, he said it turned into, you know, there are all these alpha males, and they just kind of, well, I can do this, and the next one, like, oh, yeah, well, I can do this, and then <laughs> they all outcompeted each other until literally they uh, made that thing a healthy river system that is, you know, or I should say healthier than what it was previously, and made it, you know, commercially viable for rafting, and, uh, you know, was got the cattle off the land and, you know, provided uh, uh, healthy flows that didn't kill the fish, et cetera. But ask Tom before you go, because it, it sounds like that's a, you know, it doesn't have to be exactly like that, but it's like a, a good, I'd say, a outline of how you maybe can solve some of the problems that are, um, I would say, uh, blocked by people at the top so these agencies that control different things that affect the thing. I, I just want to end here and I'll, I, I mean it's true what he said and, and I can tell you more about it. But I, want, I have a very optimistic thing and I, Bob, you here? I'm here. I'm going to bring Prescott College into this one. I'm optimistic about the future because we have an educational system that's beginning to engage the outdoor. And I think we can do more with it. And, and now I'm going to stick my neck out. And I know we have people from Prescott College that have gone on in their careers and made a big difference. Am I correct? Well, I'll talk to you. Tom, you all retired from the Senate. That was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> but Allison, Mason and Allison were here. And they're going to be doing uh, an educational course with Cal Hall. And I chatted with the other day, I said, well, can we not transmit this up to COC, I may, may not know the geography, the COCC in Oregon uh, Cascade, Oregon State University Cascade. Could we not get them to be doing a similar educational program on the upper county? So we can get not just the climate down here, but the climate up there engaged with the course and with students. And, we're, and, and so that happens, and where those students end up? What position do they end up in our system? They're going to be lawyers and doctors, and they make a lot of money. They're going to be politicians. They're going to be judges. If we can engage this educational system across the board at the college level and at the high school level, and I have thoughts that I'm going to share with you after about a high school idea, I think this is going to turn around. We're going to, we're going to make a big difference, and not just for rivers, but our whole planet. Uh, and so I am optimistic because I see this starting to happen with outdoor schools and universities and colleges. We have outdoor programs, but we need more of them, and we need to have those programs with folks that are uh, connected with the outdoors, you know, giving uh, presentations to them out on the river or they're going out there. So I am optimistic that this thing is turning around, and I'm, I just want to share the optimism I have right here. Here, 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 here. Um, We are going to need to wrap up. Um, I know, Chris, you have had your hand up for a while. Did you want to say something? Yeah. You can have the uh, last comment, maybe. Thank you. Uh, it's just a plug, uh, mostly for people working with kids. And, and like, if you could pass this on to another guy, maybe, as a possible evening program. But Adventure Scientists is looking for citizen mm -hmm. scientists to quantify the water quality of Wabi Scenic Rivers. In the room, there's too many in the Dingle Act to, for me to do it in one season as a volunteer myself. So uh, if you want to get in contact with adventure scientists, that will help quantify the water quality. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I just uh, want to thank you, Clavy, mm. for um, for not just your presentation here, you inspired some really rich discussion here, and who knows, you know, the miracle of the Klamath or the miracle of the <laughs> fill in the blank. We may have some seeds of ideas that were planted here, but you know what was also planted? My butt in a chair that had an oars name on the back, my butt in a raft that was an oars boat, um, you brought your your van. You have you brought um, coolers for us. You were an incredible sponsor to help us make this event possible. Um, and so I just really wanted to 
just express our deepest gratitude to you and to your whole family for, we know, I mean, you're an important person <coughs> at, at your organization and within your family and uh, to be able to spend so much time with us, um, to take time out of your busy life and your busy um, schedule to be able to make this possible for all of us is just, just thank you.